colleagues, uh, uh, what interests me is looking at the looking at policy from a more uh, theoretical aspect. Uh, obviously, beginning with practice, and uh, as uh, Hubert van Valkyrie said. Uh, uh, language policy is inseparable from educational policy even when uh, the connections are not explicitly stated. And what, I, what I want to look at is uh, based on my, uh, uh, my personal experience, research experience in the last few years with, uh, education, with indigenous education in Brazil, foreign language education in Brazil, and more recently with mother tongue education in India. Um, uh, I'm trying to uh, think through uh, the, the different relationships and uh, more specifically the, the way that uh, our theoretical knowledge or let's say our disciplinary epistemologies feed into policy and they come this backwards and forwards movement that, uh, that could be illustrated in that diagram that Valkyria showed in one of her last slides which, of Saviani, how practice feeds into policy and policy feeds into practice and vice versa. Um, so uh, I want to have a look first, begin with this concept of the mother tongue, uh, uh, which I think uh, uh, is a problem not only in India, it's a problem in, uh, with indigenous education in Brazil and it feeds into our policies indirectly, it's in the background of our policies of uh, uh, foreign language uh, teaching in Brazil. Uh, because whatever we as linguists have uh, uh, fed into national policies, our, our concept of the mother tongue will have serious effects on policy and on what we do in education. And behind all of this is uh, a global document, let's say, uh, which will affect local policy. It's a UNESCO 1953 document, uh, which said that each, each child should be at school and be educated in its mother tongue. Uh, without defining <laughs> child, school, or mother tongue. Right? Uh, uh, this policy then presupposes a homogeneous nation state, monolingualism, and monoculturalism right? uh, for the world. This uh, UNESCO 1953 was basically the first phase of the first post colonial phase of still the West dominating the rest. Right? Uh, this, will be, this comment will be important for uh, a couple of slides coming on in a moment. So, Education is always reduced to schooling because this is a Western perspective. Uh, policy remain, aims at facilitating the learning of the child, taking the home language to the school, again, presupposing this monolingual, monocultural situation. It presupposes the singularity and homogeneity of knowledge of the school and of the home. Right? It eliminates the difference between discourses of the school, formal, written, normative, and the discourses of the home informal, oral, non-normative. What do I mean by non-normative? The discourses of the home may not be the discourses, the dominant discourses which are in the school as an institution. It hides the difficulty and the social necessity of the child to be exposed to and acquire new knowledges and discourses apart from those of the home. So in fact, it's a policy that limits instead of a policy that opens up. Instead of singularizing and homogenizing discourses, their qualitative and functional differences could be focused on and studied. Right? So all in the name of education, what we have in fact in the policies that have developed from the UNESCO 1953 policy are, uh, uh, let's say some would call it a dumbing down, a closing down, or instead of opening up of, uh, of, po of uh, possibilities. Um, now, in my research in India, I came across uh, a reaction to this way of thinking because uh, the dominant way of thinking in, in India and in relation to indigenous education in Brazil is to follow on from this uh, UNESCO report or, or, in other words, using the Western perspective in a, in a local situation. Uh, but there is this thinker who is not very... Uh, uh, Chandani, who is not, he's a soci sociolinguist, uh, excluded from the Indian Academy to a large extent, uh, published more, more abroad than in India. But he, he says some interesting things where he's trying to resist the influence of that, uh, of the uh, external models 
from UNESCO. So he says, Western linguists presuppose, Western linguistics presupposes a literate, literate and monolingual cultures as models. These hinder the perception of diversity and heterogeneity. Uh, even in the West, I mean, uh, heterogeneity and diversity is not something outside the West. So Western linguistics creates a dichotomy between time and place separating genealogy from the local, or separating historicity from the local. When faced with diversity, Western linguistics privileges time and canonicity as a product of time, and variation is seen as newness and discarded. Uh, he, he says this in relation to Saussure's ideas of uh, uh, privileging the abstract, uh, uh, nor, uh, the abstract code instead of the uh, the more practical or what's the word? Brian, help me out. <laughs> haven't read Sociu for years. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the contingent, uh, complex, diverse aspect of the more palpable forms of language. Right? Um, so variation is seen as newness and discarded because what, what we're hoping for is what Valky referred to as well, uh, alphabetization or literacy as learning the code. So what he proposes is this. If, on the contrary, space <coughs> is taken into account, the simultaneous coexistence of heterogeneity and diversity can appear. So instead of looking at history to, f to define the authentic real language, if we look at space, the here and now, we can see the diversity. Other variants of the same language, other coexisting languages, other cultures will appear. Now this idea is also repeated in various other thinkers from the Indian subcontinent. So if the Western time-space dichotomy is overcome and space is taken into account, not, and uh, I, I call your attention here to how this plays out in this global, in our, in our discussions of the global and local. Right? So if space is taken into account, it may be perceived that time coexists as an inseparable element of space. This is what I was referring to yesterday as genealogy. Just because I'm talking about genealogy doesn't mean I'm not talking about the local, right? Because within the local, we all have not only, the local doesn't make present uh, and noticeable all our diversities. The local also, with our diversity, brings into our different socio histories. So the time is, is uh, we have to be careful for the time not to be invisible when we focus on space. So time in this fashion introduces movement and dynamism. Because if we look at our difference here within the same space, and we take into account that what makes us difference, different is the fact that we come from different contexts, different places, our genealogy looking backwards in terms of time. But this, uh, this time element which makes us different uh, interacts with our difference in space. So then we get this dynamism which makes us within space similar but within our genealogy is different, or vice versa. It brings up this play between what we call identity and difference. Right? So it breaks down fixity and leads to the perception of identity and difference and the difference in identity. Okay, so what has all this got to do with policy? Well, first, uh, we've been talking, Brian brought up the term yesterday of uh, language ecologies, but here I'm looking at something similar, which is the ecology of knowledges, which, as I mentioned yesterday, is referred to by, uh, by certain thinkers, especially um, Hansier, Jacques Hansier and uh, uh, Sosa Santos, the Portuguese thinker. And they call it cosmopolitan reasoning, a different term, use of the term cosmopolitan. But if we look at cosmopolitan reasoning as a transformation of the global into the local, or is it the opposite? <coughs> Homogenization, which is the object of policy, is confronted by heterogenization. This plays out in India in these terms, the Margaudish. The move towards a cosmopolitan reasoning requires yeah. an ethic of translation. What does this mean? Sosa Santos refers to what he calls, again, when I said, the, uh, I was making a, cri a critique of the Western paradigm or the Western epistemology of looking at policy and heter uh, and uh, excluding heterogeneity. So the Santos calls this lazy reasoning in the waste of experience. 
So there's a Western tendency to think in totalities, as in scientific, political, philosophical, etc. He calls this orthopedic thinking, uh, uh, a thinking which ossifies our, our possibilities, where totalities exclude and make invisible what has been excluded, assuming for themselves the aspect of substantive normality. It contracts the present, it reduces the present, therefore reducing complexity, and expands the future. It sees the future as progress to be attained rationally. So he says, other coexisting invisible experiences and knowledges are ignored and wasted. Wasted in this sense of not being taken into account. Uh, and he, what he proposes as cosmopolitan reasoning, as a response to lazy reasoning, is to take into account exactly the opposite, to contract the future and expand the present, or as I was saying, <coughs> emphasize space instead of using our, uh, our discourses of progress and uh, development. To make the excluded formally <coughs> invisible, visible. The previously ignored wasted experiences and knowledges now appear in their multiplicity and may be seen as an ecology of knowledges. This coexisting, conflicting diversity and heterogeneity. So the wealth, complexity, and diversity of the here and now is valorized without excluding the com complexity or identity that time introduces into space. Time in the sense of our heterogeneities, our genealogies. We, we come from different places, we come from different histories, and we coexist, right? So this brings in an element of identity and difference always in conflict or in dissensus, as Nancy I would say. So totalities may now be seen as necessary, as strategies of meaning making which do not exclude it's a different kind of totality, a totality which does not exclude but coexists with others, with other interconnected conflicting totalities. So totality is this, par is this paradoxical element which is, he sees as less than the sum of the parts. And so the need, there's a need for an ethical translation as an alternative to grand theories and as, as a strategy of mutual comprehension between coexisting totalities and diversities. On so openness to uncertainties, infinities, dissensus, no guarantees. Um, we're talking about policy still, right? Um, now, policy presupposes homogeneity. Policy presupposes uh, action based on homogeneity. Policy presupposes a sense of community. Right? And uh, Ramsey says that when we're when we're talking about community, we presuppose this. We're motivated by this egalitarian presupposition. In the egalitarian presupposition, the communal invention of discourse requires an initial breakthrough which introduces them to the community of speaking beings, some who are not hitherto of its number. This breakthrough induces a different economy of the presupposition of equality. So equality is not homogeneity. Equality is taking into account the heterogeneity and learning to deal with it in uh, in the desire for homogeneity, or in other words, is this trying to work through an ethical translation with an ecology of plural knowledges? Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, so he says a community, and this is where policy comes into becomes important because policy generally presupposes homogeneity. But if policy presupposes community, and in order to have a community, we must have heterogeneity because the community is always uh, a desire or an impulse for uh, excluding the difference which would break down the community. And this is what uh, Rancière is trying to say. The community is never of homogeneity. A community always appears from heterogeneity and it's an emphasis, it emphasizes what we have in common. This is something difficult for policy to deal with. Right? So beginning with the concept of the mother tongue as I, began, as I mentioned before, the mother tongue always, uh, our concept of the mother tongue introduces the concept of homogeneity. We don't know how to deal with the fact that uh, mother tongue is an abstract concept like literacy in its old, uh, uh, old concept. Uh, mother tongue is now plural. Right? The, the, the tongue we speak at home is not the tongue we speak at school. Right? This doesn't mean they're different tongues, but we have to uh, rethink our concepts, our homogene homogeneous concepts of mother tongue. 
So this is something that policy is, is having great difficulty in dealing with. And just I'd like to end, I'd like to go on to um, expand a little bit. Uh, uh, Uberval mentioned this of Hans Hertz's idea of the, uh, uh, emancipation. He says, the egalitarian presupposition, the communal invention of, oh, sorry, I've used this before, the effectiveness of the community of speaking beings is predicated on a violence, not the violence perhaps that Julia mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, on a violence which antedates it. The essence of this inaugurating violence is to make the invisible visible, to make, uh, to give a name to the anonymous and to make words audible where only noise was perceptible before. So this is our challenge to policy. Uh, we can see policy not working in indigenous education in Brazil because policy was uh, it, uh, gave the indigenous communities a choice of uh, only using their own language, only using their own knowledges, uh, as if this was going to emancipate them. And uh, hence, uh, what actually happened was these indigenous communities saw themselves as being marginalized. They also wanted access to mainstream, uh, mainstream educational policy, mainstream schools. So it's not... Uh, Policy can't deal with one and the other. Policy always looks in, in the direction of uh, homogeneity. Not, uh, we tried in our policy proposal to take this into account, and this is the work that Valkyrie is working on at the moment with the Ministry of Education. How can we take this? Uh, how can policy take heterogeneity and difference at a regional level into account without being reduced to what uh, uh, Huberval mentioned as simply being symbolic? Uh, objects, right, where the policy exists, the policy document which we contributed to in 2006, it's there, but people don't know what to do with it. Now, is this because, is this simply a question of not knowing how to translate it? Or is it because those who are teachers who are accustomed to translating documents are accustomed to looking for homogeneity? Again, because they have been educated in a tradition of homogeneity, they are looking for homogeneity in a document. So it's not necessarily the problem of document. It's what I'm trying to say here. It's the problem of, of our own epistemologies which produce these documents, and then we read these documents based on our genealogies on who we are. So it's, we have to somehow try to break this cycle uh, which we have in linguistics, our own categories of our own languages, limit the, our possibilities of seeing other languages in different ways. Thank you.